welcome along to today's webinar. And we're going to spend a little bit of time today uh, talking about the brain under strain. But before we get into that, uh, I just want to say a really warm welcome to everyone. Uh, I hope you're well in your own little uh, shutdown world and the challenges that you're obviously going through, some of the differences in terms of uh, where you're sitting in the, the position of what school actually looks like at the moment. Um, today, it's uh, webinar number nine as part of our Shutdown Brunch PL. And uh, I'm sure that you know there's probably been something along this, uh, this line that you've got real value out of. And look, I hope today uh, that continues for you. I guess that's my ambition to be able to make sure that I serve your needs in some way, shape or form. Um, look, this interesting topic of the human brain, for me, it's just absolutely fascinating. I don't think in schools we actually get the opportunity to spend enough time talking or learning about the human brain. Um, and it's such a vital part of the body when it comes to learning and when it comes to human behaviour. So hopefully today I'll be able to give you a little bit of insight and some strategies just to better understand the complexities, uh, the emotions, um, those challenges that we face when our young people walk into the classroom, or uh, maybe when we're just dealing with our colleagues or our parents. And it's so complex because Everyone is so unique. We're all shaped by different experiences and um, really there's not a one size fits all. And I guess that's part of the challenge when we talk about human behavior and in particular about emotions and, uh, and how we respond to situations. Um, I also got to sort of put some relevance around how we're actually feeling at the moment. I'm sure that we're all under a certain level of strain. Um, you know, you may be feeling a little bit fearful about what sort of is sitting in front of you, uh, maybe, um, we're in that protective mode and we talk about that with our families, um, the struggle that goes, that we're a bit overwhelmed, a whole range of different things will be going. For some of us, we might just be in that survival mode. You know, our partner might be, uh, I guess, probably facing some difficulties around employment, a whole range of different things. So my goal uh, today will be hopefully give us the strategy or two that if you are in that survival mode, that we get you back into taking control and set you up for what's going to be hopefully a, an enjoyable 45 minutes. Um, I'm just going to sort of... Uh, tune you in a little bit and uh, talk a bit about the control panel. Now, somewhere around your screen, what you'll find is that there will be uh, a number of functions that uh, will allow you to participate in the webinar. I can certainly see the number of participants that we've got in the room and I've got to stay right now. Um, uh, it's great to see so many people joining in for these PL um, opportunities and to be able to hopefully enhance their own learning. Um, as you'll see on that control panel, somewhere sitting in there, there'll be a chat box. What I'm going to ask you to do is to, to use that chat box as a way of communicating or to buying in or um, to asking you questions that are of relevance throughout this, uh, this webinar. At different times, I'm going to get you just to check in and we might actually start with a bit of a tune in right now. So I just want to think about, get you to think about, is your brain under strain? Now, out of 10, if you are smashing it, you're feeling great, you're on top of your game, that's going to give you a 10. But if you're finding that you are under a bit of strain, there's a bit of motion going on, um, what, uh, what I'll do there is uh, ask you to pop a number one in. So if you could just give me a range, thanks, between one and 10, pop it in the chat box and uh, we'll just have a bit of a look at where people are at and how they're feeling. So you're an A posting there, thanks, dude, good. Four. Great, thank you. Oh, this is awesome. So we've got a huge range and I reckon that's a fair enough uh, situation that we'd be facing and that would probably be um, so true, you know, that at any given time throughout the day that we'd probably face a, a whole heap of new challenges, uh, new feelings and different emotions. Um, just want to pick up on a couple of things there. What I've got um, is a little bit of a tip. You'll see in the two box that there are two options. There's either the all panellists or the all panellists and attendees. If you want everyone in the webinar to see your post, to see your comment, then can you please pop in on the Dropbox, all panellists and attendees. If you just want it to go directly to the panellists now, then um, that will in include just not only obviously me and the work that I'm doing, but Adam and Amy are sitting in the background there. They'll be able to see your question. And I've already seen one question that has popped up, um, which probably is a, a great time to mention that uh, Adam and Amy will be posting throughout this webinar one upcoming uh, opportunities for webinars over the course of the next 10 to 12 days and then to be able to help you with any other requests that you may have. Um, at the end of today, what will also happen is that within the next probably 48 hours, we'll make sure that this slide deck uh, finds its way to your inbox in the way of a PDF file. So if you're worrying about uh, taking down notes or, or trying to capture some of the images that you see on your screen, I'm gonna say stop, sit back and enjoy, just listen in and what we'll do is we'll get that email coming your way very, very soon. All right, so let's jump into it. And uh, I guess for anyone who's been in education 
over the last five, seven years, um, you'll be familiar with some of the work of Carol Dweck and in particular around some of the great stuff that she's done within growth mindset. Now, when we talk about um, the way that we can look at the brain and we talk about that left side and that right side, um, I'm just going to touch on this briefly today, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time around this actual view of the brain. When we talk about the left side, what we're talking about there is things like logic, uh, analysis, the ability uh, to use language, sequencing. Um, but on that right side, the right side is around the creativity. It's around our imagination, um, feelings. And probably the other thing too there is, uh, is around our visualization. Now, I guess if I, I sort of go right, what's the, the left side, the problem with the left side, and in particular, how we're probably feeling at the moment, is sometimes when we get too, uh, too logical with our thinking, we actually start to overanalyze situations. And that's why I'm going to say the best way to remember this is the right side is the right side for a reason, because that's our creativity side. And it's around moving from how will I survive to how can I thrive? And I guess what's sort of really heartwarming for, heart, for me at this point in time, and just really um, the highlight of this whole mess that we're in about how we're we actually going to take learning and, and apply it in a different scenario, how are we going to take learning into the home and be able to work with our young people some of the great things that our teachers are doing uh, around their creative ways of connecting with their students, their creative ways of providing support to the young kids in their classroom in that indirect way has just been unbelievably positive. And it's so uplifting. Um, you know, as I, I search through Facebook or I search through a number of the, you know, different school web pages and Facebook pages that I follow to see the many great things that are happening uh, across our education sector. And I think it comes back to that ability for our teachers to use that right side of their brain and that creativity, which is so important. Um, the risk for us, I think, at the moment in the current climate is that we focus too heavily around use of that left side, which is around that overanalysis, and I'm saying, how am I going to get the content to my students? Um, but as I said, you know, this is one way that we can look at the brain. If you're sort of interested a little bit more in that, and I know a number of the schools, and just looking at some of the names that are popping up there in the, the chat box, um, I know a number of schools are already doing some awesome stuff around the growth mindset uh, approach and how they're actually supporting their students through that angle. So what I want to do is to take a different look. I want to take a look uh, from a different slice of the brain. And really that different angle will allow us to look at, at four parts. And for people who uh, join me in my web, I'm going to go this a little bit deeper now. Um, and really the first two parts uh, I find are interesting when it comes to learning. The first one is the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum is responsible for motor skills. It's responsible for balance and for movement. And it's probably best described as the computer. Um, and when we want to function in any way, e.g., if I want to move my right arm up above my head, then what would happen is the, the cerebellum would be responsible for that. Um, any other functions, e.g., a high five, shaking hands, which obviously we can't do at the moment, that's where the cerebellum plays a really vital role. Now, the problem is with the cerebellum is that it gets tired quickly. So what we need to do is we need to recharge the batteries. And the way we do that is via sleep. Um, the second part of the brain, which I find interesting, is the stem. Now, the stem is responsible for automatic functioning. So basically what happens, there are a number of tasks that we have the ability to be able to outsource so we don't have to think about them. And you know, the two that generally come to mind are things like breathing and blinking. Now, I take my own ability to be able to learn and really I'm not great at uh, multitasking. So, you know, if it wasn't for the STEM being able to take care of breathing and blinking and I had to actually make a conscious decision to be able to do that, I don't know if I'd get anything else done uh, in a day because I'd be always thinking about the things that I have to do um, that are of higher importance. So for me, the STEM is a really vital part because it outsources those things that we don't need to worry about. Um, when we jump into that third part, now we're talking about real relevance to learning. The third part is the neocortex. Now, the neocortex is the part of the brain that is responsible, as you can see there, for thinking, logic, reasoning, language. You know, there's a bit of a, a link or a crossover here when I looked at that other cross section of the brain around the left side. The interesting thing um, that when we start to talk about the neocortex, what we're actually talking about here is the center for thinking. Um, it's the largest part of the brain. And you would probably say that in schools, this is where we can do our best work. It's when we're calm, 
when we're thinking logically that we're able to learn. Now, the other part about the neocortex is that it's good for foresight and insight. So I want to talk about foresight. What I'm talking about is saying, right, this morning, all of our participants who have joined the webinar, the overwhelming number of people that have jumped in here have said, I'm going to put a 25, I'm going to put, sorry, 45 minutes to an hour of my time aside to be able to um, delay gratification, to be able to upskill, to be able to better prepare for when I enter the classroom and I deal with these emotions that our young people bring. So I think that in itself is pretty amazing. And when we're talking about insight, it's that ability to be able to reflect. So when we walk out of a situation, when we finish teaching a lesson, when we walk away from school at the end of the day, the ability to be able to go, how did that actually go? You know, at the end of today's webinar, I'll be certainly using a little bit of insight there and going, what actually happened? Um, why and how and what sort of things did I do well? But really, what are the things that I'm going to do to be able to improve on for next time? Um, the other good thing that we can sort of use our now cortex for is the pictures. Um, and for me personally, uh, I've lived now in, uh, in Southwest Victoria for probably about oh, 35 to 40 uh, years. And, and really, if I cast my mind way back where I was uh, sort of the early stages of growing up, I was in a place called Warnable. And although I haven't been there for 35 years, I can still very clearly picture the house that I lived in, the brown bricks. I can picture the front door walking right in there. I haven't been to that place for over 35 years, but because that picture is stuck in my neocortex, it allows me to pull that out and to be able to use that, that memory at different times. So in the perfect world, wouldn't it be nice if we could say to our students, to our colleagues and to parents, please ensure that uh, between the hours of 9 and 3.30, we want you predominantly using your neocortex. We want you thinking logically. We want you calm. Uh, we want you ready to be able to learn. Now, it would be nice, but the reality is that's not the case because there's this other part of the brain that plays a, a significant role in what happens not only in human beings, but more specifically in human beings when they present in the learning environment such as a school. And that part, as you can see down the bottom now, is the limbic system. Now, the limbic system is responsible for our feelings and our emotions. And I'll touch on amygdala a little bit later on. But the other key part of the, uh, the limbic system is that it's got a couple other sort of roles uh, across the body. The first one there is that uh, there's a part within the limbic system that's called hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus um, is the, the part of the brain that releases hormones into the body. And the other sort of cool part that sort of sits in amongst the, the limbic system is oxytocin. And when I talk about oxytocin, basically the, the um, abbreviated or the uh, nickname for oxytocin is it's the love drug. So every time that we do something kind, that we do something that makes us feel good, we get this hit of oxytocin. And I'm going to pick up on that a little bit later on. But the thing is, I guess I want you to consider right now is um, your own behaviour and your own responses to situations. And maybe the people who you're living with, your family members, or the people who, you know, if you can reflect back to some of the kids that you've got in your classes, that um, as humans, we generally don't use both parts of the brain, the neocortex and the limbic system, well at the same time. We're either thinking and we're calm, or we're feeling, we're limbic. Now, the amygdala, which is that last point there, is a bit like the traffic cop, and that helps us shift between using the neocortex and the limbic system. So generally we're doing one thing better than we are the other. Now the important thing, I guess, about the limbic system um, is that unfortunately when we're using the limbic system, which is our, our, our centre for emotions, the bad side of it is that sometimes we don't have the words that we want to use at a particular time. The words don't come to us, but there are some benefits of what the limbic system is. I'm just going to sort of talk through those a little bit at the moment. Um, as I said there, and as you can see in front of your screen, it's for, informally known as the centre of emotions. And really, it ensures that our survival, um, and it provides us with that ability to be able to feel emotions and also to be able to understand behaviours that are directly connected to emotions. Now, as adults, adult learners, what we know is that some of those emotions can be both negative and I talk about things like maybe aggression, uh, fear, anger, or they can be positive. And that's like pleasure and happiness. You know, and this is where our oxytocin plays a really key role. That you know, if, uh, if I see a, a group of uh, students or a colleague walking towards a door and I open the door for them to let them in, I do a good thing and you know, they appreciate that. I can see that in their face. What's actually happened is that's made me feel good and I get that little hit of oxytocin. So that's that positive affect that we get from the limbic system. Now, 
One of the primary roles of the limbic system um, is to keep us safe. Now, the example that I sort of best use here is that if we're about to cross a really busy road, and just as we're about to step out onto the road, we see a car approaching at really high speed. What happens is the limbic system kicks in and we respond by jumping out of the way, which is a physical response. Now in that last slide, um, I talked about how it would be good uh, to continually use our neocortex, but obviously that's not the case and we don't always want that. There are times when it plays a role or it's present in schools on a daily basis. We're just gonna talk a little bit about some of those things and, and go into this part of the system in a little bit more depth. Um, the first sort of concept uh, that you may be familiar with is uh, fight or flight. Now, to take that um, understanding of the limbic system a little bit further, I just wanna spend a couple of minutes uh, unpacking the concepts of fight or flight and the relevance to our brain and how we respond when we are uh, under strain. Now, fight or flight is a response to high level or challenging um, situations or dangerous situations that present with high emotion. And what predominantly happens here is that we are using our limbic system. Now, so when those challenging, system, uh, challenging situations present, um, what actually happens to our body is the ability to think logically um, and rationally significantly decreases. So we react and we react without really getting the opportunity to think. It's sort of like a body's response to a natural reaction to danger. The two responses that we would see when we are presented with, uh, with the, the dangers would be that we would either see people stay and fight or they would flee, run away or flight. Um, what generally presents is what we call like physiological changes and they're changes that we can actually see or feel across our body. So things like an increase in our heart rate, a decrease in pain, what else happens? Our, our eyes start to dilate, our pupils dilate, our hearing becomes sharp. I often talk to this around, it's sort of our superpower. It's the stuff that happens to our body that makes us feel, in some ways, that little bit semi-invincible. Um, and it's not a conscious decision. It's funny, I was uh, watching a show, obviously we're in shutdown uh, in Victoria, and uh, as a family, we've started to try and get into a couple of Netflix series. And the one that we've selected is, uh, is Iron Fist. I don't know if anyone's seen the Iron Fist. But really, when I was sitting there with my family watching this last night, it made such relevance to what I'm talking about today. What happens is that when the, the Iron Fist, it's one of those Marvel shows, uh, is challenged and looks like he's actually going to be defeated, he can't be defeated. So what happens is he gets a physiological change to his body and his fist turns to iron. And I'm thinking, that's exactly the same as that fight or flight concept. And really what's going on in the body is that we get this reaction um, in the brain and the amygdala, that traffic cop, sends a signal uh, to the nervous system and through our limbic system that says, hey, hold on a second, something's wrong here. Um, then this, um, this response sort of continues and our body releases adrenaline. And the other sort of name for adrenaline is cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And that hormone then leads to those physiological changes that occur across our body. So while the responses may actually be of a physical nature, it's triggered by a psychological fear, and that's that brain reaction. Um, if I link it back to the classroom, and I sort of go, well, what are the, the examples of a fight or a flight that we often see? Um, I guess the, the flight situation, and in particular, I'm gonna say some of those primary school challenges that, uh, that we may face about that grade two student who feels a little bit overwhelmed, um, often will respond by running out of the classroom, and you know, we go chasing after them, or we send someone to go and grab them. Um, they're basically demonstrating that concept of flight. They're just running away or they're avoiding the situation. It might be for a whole range of different reasons. But when I think about the fight, and I go back to my time as a print, I remember this very, very clearly. This day st sticks with me, um, and I often tell this story. Is, uh, we were over in, uh, in KL for a school trip, an overseas school trip, and what actually happened is, uh, as a group in the, the, the hustle and bustle of KL, we were approached by a group of uh, young men, and. Um, they're actually quite intimidating. And what happened is they started to, to follow us from um, all different angles. And I started to get uh, a little bit nervous about the situation, started to sort of bring the group in a bit closer to me. And what I actually felt was this physiological change to my body. You know, I couldn't run away and leave the 20 students who I had in my care uh, just to look after themselves. I thought, I'm going to have to protect them here. So what actually happened is these physiological changes to my body felt like they gave me this superpower. Now, lucky enough, we were okay. We got back to our hotel. But... That's a situation, I guess, when it's an excursion or when we've got kids at our care 
that as adults or as teachers, we often go down that path of, uh, of fight before we go to flight because we can't just run away from the situation. Um, all right, you'll see there too, just want to sort of point you back to that chat box. At different times, uh, Amy and Adam will be posting for the upcoming webinar. So just copy, cut that link out, copy it, pop it into an email, send it around to your staff, send it around to your other leaders. Uh, generally speaking, Adam's uh, work is more directed towards leaders, school leaders, as where Amy's just going to uh, basically continue on that path that I'm continuing on around supporting all teachers. So if at any stage you feel that that might be of interest to you, then I'd say to register. All right, let's, uh, let's keep moving along. And while we're talking about the brain under strain, doesn't this word often come to our mind? Stress. And it's a word that we throw around our staff rooms. It's a, it's a word that we talk about quite regularly at school. And it's a word that I guess when we talk uh, and hear what the media's got to say about school, this word stress keeps uh, popping up. Stress, I guess probably the best way to explain stress, it's really, it's, a, it's the body's way of responding uh, to any kind of demand or to threat. And those threats might be real, but at the same time, they might only be perceived. Now, the thing I, I often talk about, I know I've got a couple of my partner prints uh, from uh, partnerships that I've got sitting in the room here. They know how much I love talking about continuums. Um, I think stress occurs along a continuum. And the thing about that continuum is that at one end, what we've got is really chronic stress. Now, when we talk about chronic stress, um, we're talking about sort of that long-term repeated pressure that's placed on us. And if I was to say, what are the top two things that cause stress across uh, school prints, across uh, teachers, it generally comes back to the, the two being one workload and, and two student behaviour. But I guess if we were to say along that continuum, there's another really key thing. And without downplaying stress too much, I'm talking about the other end of the continuum, which is feeling uncomfortable. Now, it's okay that at times we feel uncomfortable. I'm going to talk about good and bad stress in a second. But when I was a print, I had a really good relationship with, uh, with my staff. And I know a couple of them uh, who are sitting in the webinar today and, uh, and, and I'm sure are sort of taking this going. I remember those conversations that we used to have. Um, when a staff member would be put into a situation that they'd feel uncomfortable, um, what they'd often say to me is, oh, Simon, I'm feeling a bit stressed about this. And because I had a good relationship in place, I was able to stop and say to them, are you feeling stressed or are you just a little bit scared about what's about to happen? And just getting to think about that word scared. And I think when we talk about that word scared, quite often in kids, when kids are under pressure, they use the word scared. But as adults, what we do is we often default to the word stress. And that's okay. But if we to place that on a continuum and say, at what point in the continuum does that stress actually sit? I think that's really important conversation to have. One, across our staff room and two across our school, because there's not a clear point that people go, I've now tipped over and I'm stressed. Stress is something that can occur in quite a, a low level, and it can be just that feeling of being uncomfortable at quite a high level. And let's talk a little bit about that right now. Um, good stress versus bad stress. I think when we talk about stress, um, there's this myth that goes with stress that stress, stress is bad, it makes you sick, it's the enemy. Well, at times that can be the case, but I think there's a lot of uh, other stuff that goes on around stress that we sometimes don't harness or we sometimes don't embrace. So that bad stress is, which I've already sort of mentioned, the chronic stress, best described for me, I, you know, I often give this example, it's a bit like the car engine that idles too high for too long, and that's not good for our health. So in schools, as I said, sort of evident generally by workload and student behaviour. But if I was to have a look at the good stress, and I've used that picture there of the microphone, because for me, this is the perfect example. And although it's not talked about enough, it's something that if we can embrace and harness, it actually helps us. And if I take um, my time, you know, I don't mind keeping fit and healthy. If I go to the gym, um, what we actually do is we, um, when we lift weights, we place our muscles, deliberately place our muscles under stress. So they tear and they fall apart. And then as they regrow, they regrow stronger. And I think that same metaphor can be applied to school situations. If we were to put ourselves in a situation or put our kids in a situation where they're going to feel uncomfortable, they're going to feel a little bit of stress, but if we provide a, a support for them to be able to feel that in a safe way, then what's going to happen is they're going to come back stronger from those situations. And the, the perfect examples that, uh, that pop up for me would be things like public speaking, um, the opportunity to speak at Parent Information Night. And, you know, I often have this with our middle leaders who are just about to step into some type of public event. And for the first time, it's quite overwhelming. Now, the other part is things like it might just be as simple as that first peer observation that you had. But if you can think about that good stress and apply it to our students, 
getting them to talk about their emotions in the class, again, it makes them feel uncomfortable. But if we can control it in a way where it's safe to do so, then that's actually going to help their growth and their development. So the really key thing for me is that not all stress is bad stress. And if we can harness that good stress, that's actually going to help us see things in a different light. So what I'm going to do is that if I go back to that sort of opening slide um, and I talk about well, what's the topic for today, it was about managing the emotions in, in yourself, managing the emotions of uh, parents, students and of your colleagues. I'm just going to quickly talk about uh, the different groups now and how we actually could manage some of those emotions. I guess the first part is where do we start? What's the most important thing here? And I'm going to say the most important thing without fail is you. You are the most important part of this puzzle. Um, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time today talking about self-care. I am going to touch on what I think are, are a couple of key things. But if you want a more detailed, in-depth understanding of what's the best way to look after number one, then what I'm going to refer you back to is Amy's presentation. I think uh, from memory it was last Thursday. Amy um, led through what, what I felt was just like a really interesting and engaging 50 minutes on teacher self-care. So if you haven't seen that webinar, um, just maybe pop something in there and Amy might be able to help us out. And uh, if you have seen it, I think, you know, for me, that's uh, number 101. There's some great strategies there. Um, but as teachers, we've got to look after the emotions that we present first and foremost. And I guess I'm just going to quickly um, work through how it sits and where it fits um, for me. To see a couple there. Catherine, thanks for that. Amy, I hope you're able to help us out. Apologies for just throwing you in there without any, any warning. Catherine, if you do miss it, I'll be able to follow that one up with you as well. Um, all right, so the, the big five for me, uh, number one, and in no particular order, but as you'll just see as we work around the screen, um, what we've got there will be uh, the importance of nutrition. We are what we eat and making sure that we, we look after the food that goes in, the fuel that goes into our body. Um, the second one that I've got down the bottom there is social connection. Don't be mistaken for the fact that I've used a picture with alcohol uh, by coincidence or by accident. Um, what's actually happened here is that for me, it's the importance of social connection. Now, the relevance to this, um, I guess, is that in the absence of that social connection that we've got at the moment, we need to find a way. And we're seeing some pretty cool stuff happen through social media and through other online platforms. But social connection, as humans, we are hardwired for connection and it's important that we find that. And you know what? I am going to slip in there. It's okay to have the odd uh, drink and de-stress by enjoying a, a beverage after a Friday night and making sure that, that uh, that's something or strategy that, that works for you, then that's okay. Uh, as I go through the middle there, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about exercise because what happens with exercise is that it releases uh, the hormone of uh, the endorphin hormones across our body. And really what they are, if I can sort of put them into layman's terms, it's like a natural painkiller um, that makes us feel good. So when we exercise, we feel good. Um, continually, I guess for me, I've put that there as the, the biggest slide because um, for me, it, the biggest sorry, picture on the slide because for me, that's my go-to. Um, as I sort of keep working around, I've got the clocks there. And for me, the clocks represent routine. Keeping a morning routine at the moment is really important. Keeping a daytime routine and an evening routine in this current situation, I think is, is super important. But if I go back to the, the reality of normality, and that reality is around um, the stress that sometimes we bring into the workplace. And, and why I say that is because we've all got busy lives. And if you're like me, um, my wife's a teacher, um, I'm obviously um, spending time in schools and we've got four beautiful children who are all at school. You could imagine with the six of us trying to get out the door ready for a big day in school, it's actually quite a hectic place and that provides stress. Now, we're fortunate enough not to have huge traffic um, in the area that I live, but for some people, they then sort of go from the hustle and bustle of their home into you know, peak hour traffic and then into the reality of what school presents at, at any given moment. So it's important that our routines allow us to de-stress. Um, the fourth one there, or the fifth one, sorry, and I've got this picture of someone uh, taking themselves to a different place. So a bit of meditation. I'd have to say, you know, relaxation is the key to this. Um, for me, this wasn't something that I was great at when I was a prim. Um, I sort of felt that I was a little bit invincible. I sort of felt that, you know, I didn't need that downtime. Any opportunity I got, I'd sort of go, right, I need to work. But it wasn't until I started to use some relaxation techniques that I felt that the real benefits come from it. And then I started to realize that um, I was actually a better leader and I was actually a better teacher. So it's not healthy to have our adrenaline or our cortisol levels running high for such a long period of time. Um, 
So for me, I just come up with sort of like a couple of strategies that I use. And I'm going to share with you what I think is you know, the number one. The first um, sort of thing that I tried was actually the best one. I read this book one day and it was about this uh, US Navy SEAL. And he gives this example of when they were in um, combat, a strategy that they are taught would be what's called box breathing. And box breathing is, is quite simply the opportunity to be able to breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, out for four seconds, hold for four seconds. And you do that four times. It takes you about 40 seconds. And it is amazing the ability to use that strategy for me before I one go into a big stage and talk about you know, the stuff that I love, two before I walk into a classroom, um, or any situation that's actually gonna give me a, a little bit of a hit of adrenaline to be able to just center that. So for you, I'm sure that you look around that box here and we've all got our go-to. We've all got our little strategy. We go, you know what, for me, this is what I default to. I'm just going to get you, if you can just maybe use the, uh, the chat box there, just pop it in. What's the one of the five that you go to? Or you might have another one. There might be something that you use that you go, for me to be able to center me, to be able to de-stress, to be able to feel good, this is what I go to. I'll just give you a quick minute while I have a drink. Start popping those results. Exercise, yep. Yeah, the kettle. Hey, good one. I like that one. You're right. That's probably the same for me. And in the home environment, a little bit challenging, Judith, because I'm using that, uh, that kettle to the nth degree. Yeah, cool. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, exercise. So important. All right. Let's, uh, let's keep moving along. Um, I'm going to put uh, the next four categories, I guess, probably um, under the umbrella of empathy. Now that we've got ourselves sorted, now that we're looking after number one, what I'm going to talk about is the other stakeholders that we have to often um, manage their emotional state. Now, under the umbrella of, of empathy, when I talk about empathy, what I'm sort of talking about is the ability to care and understand. So, you know, we often hear the analogy of walking in someone else's shoes. For me, um, the really key part about empathy is let's not get that mistaken for sympathy. When we talk about empathy, what we are using is language like, I see or I'm hearing that. So we're hearing it from their point of view. What is sometimes the, the situation we fall into is sympathy. And when we talk about sympathy, we're going along the lines of, oh, I know. And the actual fact is, or the reality is, we don't really know what someone else is feeling. So sympathy is when we're talking about ourselves and Empathy is when we're talking about someone else. Um, I, I think what's, you know, probably, and Adam would often use this example, and I think for me, it's probably the best example that, that I can come up with too, is that when we talk about, unfortunately, that situation when uh, we may have the death of a family member or someone close to us, and obviously we're, you know, going through a fair bit of grief. Now, what happens is that if we were sympathetic to someone, what we'd do is we'd send them flowers, and that would make us feel good. But if we were really empathetic, what we'd do is we would send them a lasagna or a casserole because we know that that's what they need during those times there. So um, there is a really fine line between sympathy and empathy. And I'm going to sort of, as we get into each group, just talk a little bit about that. But what I want you to take away is that when it comes to managing the emotions of the, the parents, the students and our colleagues, that overarching approach needs to be really empathetic. And that's probably the most important thing that we can, uh, we can do. And it's not something you can learn overnight. You know, we've got to sort of develop those skills and um, we've got to take that to a level of developing that into our young people. All right, so when I talk about um, colleagues, I think that when we, when we support our colleagues to manage their emotions, I think this is probably the hardest of our stakeholders to be able to get right. And the reason why I think it's so hard is, number one, I think it's easy to insult or to, our, or to offend our colleagues. And the reason why is I, sit, I sat back and I thought about this and thinking, why is it that that's sometimes the case? And I think it's because our colleagues see that we're on the same level as them. And what actually happens is that um, we put up this sort of this strong face or this, this you know, brave shield around us to say, we're okay and don't let people in. Now, I think that when we talk about how we best support our colleagues, you know, I gave that overarching umbrella, the umbrella that sort of sits over the top and we sort of talk about empathy here. When I talk specifically about our colleagues, what's really important is that we don't put fuel on the fire. If we have a, a colleague who walks into the staff room, they go, oh, you know what? I just had 8C. Oh, they behaved like this. They were doing this. The worst thing we can do is fuel that fire 
by responding with, yeah, I know, you know what? I had them last year. And every single time, this is the way. And all we're doing is we are taking away the ability to empower that staff member and we're rescuing them. We're going into that, that mindset of, I'm going to make things worse for you by fueling that fire. So that's the number one thing when it comes to supporting our colleagues through their emotions is let's move back to how do I empower them? What I'm hearing is that this, have you tried this? Second thing around our colleagues um, is the ripple effect. We had this uh, strategy introduced at the school that I was working at there because what we found is that we responded to high level behaviors or critical incidents really, really well when it comes to managing the kids. But what would happen is if we had an incident that may have occurred on, um, during a recess break, that our intervention with the students was exceptionally good. But what had happened is the bell would go, everyone would go off to their class. And what we weren't realizing was the impact and the stress that that type of behavior was having on the teacher who was on yard duty. And what would happen is the teacher would then be expected to go off to their class and you know, deliver the perfect lesson and just to go on with the normal running of a school day, which we know is really unfair. So we had a situation that if a teacher who was on yard duty was involved, part of that ripple of a critical incident, then they would need to be part of the solution, that they would need to check in to make sure that they are okay, a debrief opportunity. So I think sometimes what we do is we default to working um, specifically around student behaviour, but what we sometimes ignore is the stress and the emotion that places on the adults who may be in the same situation. So I'm sure right at this point, you're all thinking about does that work for us? Does that sit well for us? What do we do for our teachers? Because I think providing that support around the emotions that are presented for our teachers actually helps that class be more effective and therefore decreases the chance of further escalation of things going wrong. And I guess number three, when it comes to supporting our teachers, stay in your lane. Our teachers bring so many different uh, emotions to school and, and quite often we don't know the story behind the story. So a lot of the stress might start outside of school, the emotion might start away from the school environment, but then we come into a high emotive uh, environment in the school, uh, the school yard. What I'm gonna say is that you're not a psychologist, you're not expected to have all the answers. All you're expected to do is to identify and refer. So stay in your lane, don't feel like you can fix things for people. It's important that you just provide that support uh, and a real empathetic approach. All right, second group, uh, or third group, sorry. Parents, I could only imagine, you know, I look at that picture and I go, you know what? That would be playing out across so many Australian homes right now. And I feel for some of the parents who would be in that situation. Um, I guess when your parents visit you and they are emotive, when they are really worked up, when something's happened to the people who they care the very most about, which is their kids, and they come into bat for them, or something that's occurred in their own personal life, and what they feel is that the school is the safe place they can come and get that frustration out or, or, or let that emotion run wild when they come in. So, you know, and I go back to my time, I had so many parents who would come into my office and, uh, and, and yell and scream and just want to get it off their chest. But really, when I started to get through, it actually had nothing to do with the school, but it was a safe place for them to come where there was no judgment. Um, the important thing when we're dealing with our parents is we need to fight that natural urge of responding and fixing. If a parent calls us up and just wants to let it out, if a parent comes into our office and just wants to talk, because of the emotion that they're going through. My number one strategy and the strategy that I stand, that has stood for me the test of time, is just to listen, to take notes and to paraphrase. And the reason why we do it is this. Number one, if we listen, it gives the chance for that person who is in our office or on the phone to be able to shift from the limbic system back to the neocortex. So when we're using the limbic system, we're not really sure of the words that we want to use or could use. We're actually saying things that are just coming out. So what we need to do is get back to using our neocortex. And the way we do that is over time. The second thing is when we take notes, it actually shows that we're listening. And we're taking down key points for them to be able to feel like this person's listening to me. And then the third place is paraphrase back. So what I'm hearing is this. And again, all those things combine and contribute to showing empathy. Now, I would also recommend that things don't have to be fixed straight away. Our default position as teachers is to be able to get things and sort them out quickly. Our, our default position as prins and as leaders is to be able to go, right, I need to get this issue sorted so that I can get on with the rest of my day. Let it sit there for a few hours. Let it sit there for 24 hours. But it's important that you provide that clarity for the person that you're going to get back to them within 24 hours, within the week. Quite often what will happen is when you do respond as a follow-up, 
that the issues have gone. The issues weren't really the issues. It was just the emotional state that that particular um, person was in and they just needed an ear to hear from. So quite often, um, my other second and, and most important bit of advice that I often say to my teachers and to, to any teachers that I work with, don't personalize it. Depersonalize any of the comments that are coming your way because when a person is limbic, they're saying things that they don't really mean. And what happens is if we personalize it, that's when we start to carry some of that emotion. So it's important that we go, right, that's just the behavior. I'm gonna box that up and put it to the side. What I'm hearing is this and how can I help you with that? And I've left, lucky at last, our students. I think the important thing about the kids and, and the stress that they bring, um, when we talk about kids, I guess the really challenging thing is the unfortunate situation is that when kids are exposed to chronic stress at a young age, they are more likely to present with behavioural issues as they um, you know, go through their, their adolescent years. And sometimes the horse is bolted, but there are things that we can do to be able to help our young people and, and to be able to limit some of those emotions that they bring, those, those negative emotions that they bring. Um, I guess the sort of other thing too is that that fight or flight may be more prevalent at a, at a lower level in the young people. And in particular, the, the two examples and the, the flight that I've given you earlier in the presentation there where you know, kids are just happy to get out of the situation. Um, I guess my, my biggest thing here is again, you know, and I talk about that umbrella of empathy. Um, the biggest thing here is a restorative approach to be able to support the kids who we have in our care. And that's about strengthening relationships and repairing harm. And I know again, just looking at the, the number of participants that we've got here, that a number of people are, are certainly one, familiar with restorative practices and the approach and the way that supports kids, but two, are actually doing some awesome stuff in their school and are well and truly on that, uh, that journey. And when I talk about relationships, I think the important thing here is it's about a proactive approach. If we've got a solid relationship with our students, we are more likely to be able to support them through those emotional challenges that they have, because they rely on us, they need someone. Um, the second thing is uh, within them to sort of, I guess a, a little bit of a build on the relationship is our responsibilities are our roles to be firm and fair, um, to be able to provide high support, but at the same time, high accountability. So it's not just a pat on the back for everything, but it's about high support and high accountability for our kids. Um, I'm gonna be running a presentation, sorry, another webinar a little bit later on uh, in this offering, which is around um, firm and fair. And that may be of some interest to people around how do you strike that balance and how do I get it right? The third thing is language. Um, effective statements for me is so important. It's about telling our kids how they feel, we feel about their behavior. How's that affected me? And that can be again, positive or negative, but I don't think we tell our kids enough how their behavior has affected someone else or how it's affected me personally. So it's important that we use that, uh, that effective approach. The third or the fourth thing rather um, is space. What I'm gonna say is give your kids space. Don't back them into a corner and expect them to resolve the situation right now and to deescalate and to push their emotions to the side because they don't have the ability to be able to do that well. What we need to do is provide them space. And again, I go back to space being the opportunity for kids to move from their limbic state to their neocortex back to the thinking, back to the logical mindset and away from that emotional mindset. So by providing them space and again, high accountability, high support, we're actually gonna get ourselves the best chance of success. And you notice I use those words, best chance of success, because I don't think there is a, a, a silver bullet to this. There's not one way that we can go, um, the emotions that the kids bring to our class need to be resolved in this way. And the reality is that applies to adults as well. So the brain does feel under strain. I'm just gonna give you a quick, tip here on, uh, on brain health uh, as we just sort of bring our webinar closer to the finish. Um, just as we do that, I'm just having a quick look through the questions, just making sure that I've answered them. All right, what are my, uh, what are my brain health tips? When we talk about brain health, number one, I think is uh, be a lifelong learner, um, continuing to learn new things and being able to maintain those connections with learning are so important. Um, number two, Get uncomfortable. This is the good stress stuff. Get out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself mentally. That's good stress that actually helps our brain grow and develop. Number three, be social. And I, I keep coming back to this one. For me, the importance of being social uh, as human beings, we rely on that. We're hardwired to like social connections. And in the absence of that physical connection that we've got at the moment, we have to find different ways. And I know that, that would be challenging people in all sorts of different ways, but uh, making sure that we find that social connection. I see Melinda uh, Williams, Melinda's in the, um, in the Zoom today. 
I presented at Melinda's school uh, last term and following the presentation, they had a day at the, the bowls club, which was like an awesome way to finish what was a big week. And again, it was just building those social connections across our staff. The other thing about social connections is that when we actually know something personal about the people we work with, we're more likely to care for them. So it's about building some of those social and personal connections. And the last one to stimulate some brown, uh, brown, uh, brain health is to strain your brain. Think of all the, the mental activities. And again, I, here I come back to my continuum. You know, watching a TV documentary might be quite passive. Um, and where does that sit on the, that continuum? While learning how a, a new language might be at the other end of the continuum. So think about how am I actually going to strain my brain? And what are the things that I'm going to do that can actually help me um, mentally be stimulated to be able to sort of be uh, a bit more emotionally balanced. And that's what we're looking for, balancing our emotions. All right, um, while I'm on about social connections, if you haven't seen it, I'm sure you already have, this is uh, absolutely going off. Next Thursday night, we have got uh, a trivia night for trapped teachers. So what I'm gonna say now is that if you take nothing out of this presentation today, please take the point that I see social important as being so vital to our well-being and to our um, managing our emotions. And if you haven't signed up yet, um, please follow some of the links that are going to be around this, uh, this webinar today. The important thing to note here is that it's in isolation. So you're going to have to bring your own drinks and your own food. Um, but we're going to connect you in a whole range of different ways. So if you're looking for something to do next Thursday night, come along and you'll have a great night with us. Upcoming webinars. So tomorrow to finish off the week, Amy will be presenting uh, the how to teach, contribute and know when you have done enough. So again, targeted at teachers, I would be saying right now, if you've got any, any space tomorrow, find the space to come along and listen to Amy. She's a, a super presenter. And for me personally, I've managed to get so much out of her webinars and I'd be strongly encouraging anyone uh, to be able to jump into that tomorrow. And then just before we, uh, we finish up, I want to say a massive thanks. Thank you for, one, the, uh, the time that you've committed to your professional learning today, but also for the other webinars that you've joined. If you've got any questions that are of relevance to today, then feel free to reach out to me, either one via email or two via phone call. If you um, need anything else, I'm more than happy to have a bit of a chat to you. Um, I'm just going to check that box once more, how to join. Oh, Amy... We might just repost that link there, Amy, if, uh, if that's possible for tomorrow. Anne-Marie will just change that. And I think that's all the questions answered. Thank you. I hope you've managed to get something out of today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Thursday, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thanks a lot. Bye. Ah, perfect. There's that link right there. I'll just give people a couple of uh, another 30 seconds or so and then I'll jump out of this webinar. All right, cool. Thank you. I will stop the share now. Um, you'll be able to find some more details on our Facebook page later on today. Um, link to self-care one, Jackie. Yeah, we might just pop that uh, through our Facebook page, if that's cool. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.